Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell. I'm Krista This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is- Everybody, you're not going to believe it. This is Mark Shulman, and we are listening to the Break It Down Show. Are you ready? And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, you are. John Fryer has been a veteran producer. His credits include the likes of Depeche Mode, Fad Gadget, Cocteau Twins, Peter Murphy, Modern English, Jesus Jones, White Zombie, Love and Rockets, Nine Inch Nails. For crying out loud, this list is a mile long. You've also been the keyboardist for This Mortal Coil and its offshoot band, The Hope Blister. And we are elated to have you on the Break It Down show. John, thanks for joining us. Can I just say one thing? Veteran sounds like... I've retired and given up already. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> we'll call you the master. Still at it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still going strong. Well, Pete was going to use the word master, but when I hear master, I imagine a guy who's in a mountain cave somewhere and you have to climb up the mountain to go hear him pontificate and drop words of wisdom. And that sounds like he's old and given up. But you are still vibrant, still after it. And that's one of the things that we want to know is having amassed the body of work that you have, what are you up to this minute? Well, lucky enough, you caught me on a good week because this week, the first seven inch vinyl for Black Needle Noise has just been received and will be shipped out this weekend. And we just released a video, a new song with Antic Clay called That Which Watches online. So it's like busy week, all for black needle noise. I'd like to know that you've seen the music industry go through quite a lot in the years that you've been in. Now that we have online access to our favorite artists, how has that changed your creation process, if it has at all? Well, to be honest, I think digitally recording makes life a bit easier to the analog recording. Because when you commit to take, it's there. And the only way to change anything is you have to cut the tape to edit it. Yep, on a flatbed with a razor blade. Yeah. Yes, and we used to do a lot of that. But now yep. we're cut, copy, paste. If you want yep. to rearrange the song or you're doing remixes, it's so much easier. Yeah, especially with copying. What about, you know, also, I think we've uh, come to take for granted Control-Z, Yeah. Uh, which is undo. Yes. You don't have undo when you've got a razor blade. Well, the razor blade kind of is the undo. <laughs> yeah, but, but that is. Uh, but the thing is, when you undo on, on a computer, you can actually come back. When you make a cut, you know it's it's much harder because you have to get the sticky tape out, put it back together, and hopefully you haven't destroyed anything on the way. How much of that old school analog recording did you do? Because it seems like you got really, really busy in the mid '90s at the dawn of the digital revolution. Well, the whole of the 80s was analog, even up to the 2000s, because the early digital world, I didn't like, because the quality was not great. Yeah. It sounded better just recording on a cassette, the quality, rather than the digital format. So I stayed away from it for a long time. A purist. No, now it's much better. So now it's uh, everyday occurrence. Yeah. Well, what do you think the digital revolution has done to songwriting in general? Do you think that people are more or less creative? Do you think it served creativity or robbed it? No, I think it's helped and made it easier for the masses. You know, it's much easier. You know, I heard recently there, there was these guys who just, you know, because now you've got all these loop download sites. And they just made songs by downloading a bunch of loops, put them together and said, hey, we've written a song. So. <laughs> okay. Well, what do you think about that? Because the debate that we've been having with folks is that, you know, it's a different kind of creativity. Uh, there are some old school folks who say, yeah, but it's just grabbing and throwing together things. And other people who say, well, that's like saying that writing a book is grabbing a bunch of words and throwing them together. It's still writing a book. Well, I guess there's... You know, good and bad elements in both <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You know, it's like anyone can write a book. Anyone can write a song. I'm not saying they're all going to be classics. That's the difference. Okay. You know, it's like everyone can sing, but not everyone can sing really well. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, everyone can sing in the shower or in the bathtub in the car, but, you know, they're not going to make, you know, the stage with it. So, you know, it's, that's how it is in songwriting too. It's, sure. It's the, like going the, to a restaurant. You know, you've got a good restaurant, you've got a bad restaurant. You've got a good chef, you've got a bad chef. Yeah. Tell us where it all started for okay. your enthusiasm in music. Well, enthusiasm music started when I was much younger listening to music and, you know, listening to records. And then as I got into a teenager, I tried to form a band, play guitar, but wasn't very good at playing guitar, but helped my other friends, you know, when they played live in the pubs in London, helped setting up the gear, helped setting up the sound. And then they went to Blackwing to make some demos. And then it was just a very fortunate time where I'd been made redundant from my job and Eric, who ran Blackwing, needed someone to help him. So it was kind of, I went there and said, hey, I need a job. And he said, hey, I need someone to work here. Start now. <laughs> right. And I left 10 years later. Wow, that was a serendipitous beginning. Yeah. And that was it. You know, the, the first day, like most days, was at least 12 hours. You know, working there was at least 12 to 18 hours day, every day. You had to learn to love it fast. It takes a special kind of person to be an engineer in the studio. Not everyone can do it. We love all the jobs that take a special kind of person uh, because it requires a dedication that everybody isn't wired for. Yeah. And on the one hand, you can go, well, it takes a special kind of idiot to want to work those long hours. But on the other hand, magic comes out of those long hours. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, job satisfaction comes out of it. It's always, you know, you're making a lot of people happy. You're pleasing a lot of people by the end results. Yeah. You know, a lot of jobs, you can't say that. That's for sure. So talk about the progress from just getting into audio, learning how to set everything up, doing the physical work, to when you began being hired for your ear. I mean, fortunately, it because of the studio and I guess the time, it was like 1980, um, it was on the cusp of electronic music, really. You no, know, things just fell into place very quickly, you know, and after a year of being in the studio, starting as a novice, I was already like engineering after two years I was co-producing and like three years producing. So things moved very fast, took to making music like Dr. Walker. Yeah, I guess. You, no schooling, no uh, formal education? No, it just, you know, it was just be there every day and learn as you, you know, sit, watch and learn. Give him a chance to, you know, you try and set up this guitar sound, you try and set up this bass sound, you know, and then if things went wrong, then, you know, that was, if someone was there to point me in the right direction. So it was just you know, learn as you go. When you're, yeah. when you're in the room with some of these world-class acts, though, at what point do you get comfortable? Like, look, early in your career, you're dealing with Yaz and Upstairs at Eric's. I mean, that's one of the greatest albums of all time. I mean, not just us saying that. Rolling Stone says that. And then you've got Depeche Mode very early in their career. Are you in that environment? Are you comfortable? Like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Or are you just doing what you're told? When you were back then with these major acts, how did you figure out your space? But back then, they weren't major acts. They were just starting off. <laughs> Could you tell that they had something special? I think, you know, even if they've gone somewhere or they haven't gone anywhere, I think all bands are special. You know, like some records I've made where I sat there and at the end of it going, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing, and it doesn't really sell anything. Then other records, you sit there and go, okay, it's okay, and then it flies. So you can't really second-guess the general public what they're going to like, what's going to fly, what's not going to fly. You know, what the journalist is going to pick up on, what the journalist is not going to pick up on. You know, it's just like art. It, I mean, music form, the art form, it's, you know, what is a good painting to you is not a good painting to someone else. What a good song to you, you know, and what, what a good song to someone else is could be completely different. Boy, ain't that the truth. Yeah. I mean, not knowing what's going to take off. First of all, that says that you've surrounded yourself with able-bodied, capable folks, whether they had achieved greatness in everybody's memory and really kind of stuck with, with us with their work or whether they didn't achieve the greatness that they may have deserved. But you can still get a sense that when somebody's not there quality-wise, you know, you can feel that. And it sounds like you haven't had to deal with too much of that because you were in a place where you were surrounded by quality. And fortunately, I think through my career, I've, I've been surrounded by a lot of quality, yes. A lot of, great, yeah. a lot of great personalities. 
you got a lot of guitars hanging on your wall behind you. Do you play much guitar? I haven't been recently, but I try to with my own stuff, yeah. Let's it's talk nice. a little bit about your own stuff. What are you working on right now? Well, I'm always, for the last two years, I, these black needle noise, I concentrate on that. Right. So, and that is just more like a stream of consciousness. So it's whatever I feel like writing or whatever comes out of, out of me, whatever sonic landscape it creates. Because it's not a band format, I don't have to you know, go, okay, so it has to fit in this box now. With Black Needle, it can sound like it can be anything. If you listen through all the songs that I've put out so far, it's, you know, there's not really, you know, one or two sound similar, but they're all kind of, I'm the constant theme to them, but they all kind of sound different. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So in terms of Black Needle Noise, you're doing something that you want to do artistically. So, okay, let me back up and say this. A little while ago, we had Andy Summers on the show, and he's sort of in a spot in his career where his success allows him to not have to really serve any master. He gets to do what he is inspired by, and, and that's a unique position to be. And you seem to be in a, in a similar position where you're going to do what you want to do with the stream of consciousness and that kind of thing. What yeah. what inspires you? What's out in front of you? What do you see where you're at? It's a... Uh... Everyday life kind of inspires me, and you know, you, it's when you sit down to write a song. You sometimes you think, okay, I'm going to go in this direction with the song. It's going to take this path, and then something along the way, maybe just a sound. I mean, sounds talk to me. Sounds are alive, so you can find this one other sound which suddenly takes the song in a totally different direction to where you started. So you know, you might have started out with kind of a bluesy song and then it ends up being you know like a electronic 80s song or something so it's there's never whatever comes out wherever it ends up is good but that's what i say the difference is when you have a band you kind of have a as you can see what i'm making here is yeah. a bop which you kind of <laughs> that band has to fit in that sound you know right and so if you write anything else then you have to put it to the side and say okay i've got to write something else that also fits into that sound and a lot of the Black Needle Noise stuff was songs I had written while having the other bands that just didn't fit into that into that sound or that format. So it's kind of like Andrew Lamore, who we've had on the show also. He's like, you know, I feel like having this other project where it's going to be more R&B or whatever it's going to be. I'm just making that part up. And so he'll just, yeah. start, he'll, he'll just be in four bands at once trying to have as many boxes as he can so he can right. kind of do what he wants to do. Is that kind of jive with what you're talking about yeah but instead of having you know you're saying four different boxes or four different bands now mm -hmm. i just concentrate on the one sure and i just do and i put out you know it could be an r&b track it could be a, you know like the last song i just put out is more all, all country you know alternative country uh dark noir sounding which is different to the one before which had uh it was more of a dramatic um love song which was sung in mexican and the one before that was sung in, in African. So, you know, it's, it's whatever I want it to be. And do people f find this at blackneedlenoise.bandcamp.com? Is that where your stuff is? When I first release it, it goes up there. And okay. then after it's been there for three or four weeks, then it gets spread uh, digitally everywhere else. So it's on Spotify. It's on Pandora. It's on Tide. It's on Rhapsody. It's, you know, you name it. And you can get it on vinyl uh, at the end of this month, which is a di mere days from now. You can get the, you can get the first seven inch, which the songs on there are only on the vinyl. They're not released anywhere else on digital or anything. Okay. So that's now we're talking. There's 150 copies, and that's all there's going to be. And they're all signed. They're all numbered by me. So if you want one, then you have to go to no devotion no devotion band camp page and order from there it's the only place you can get it it's 20 bucks yeah for a run of 150 there is no better investment in a collector's item than i'm seeing right now yeah black needle noise before the tears came 20 bucks come on everybody that's, give give that website address so we can make sure that everybody who is doing the dishes and wants to write it down has it Okay. Well, it's no devotion records dot bandcamp dot com. So it's something here. That's for the album that's going to be out in September. You need to. Oh. I am you on there. Okay. For the I am you is the seven inch single, which is out now. Just came out this this week and will be shipped out this weekend. Okay. That's what drops March or excuse me May thirtieth. 
And so I'll put a note to that in the show notes, so that way yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put links. Right. Uh, that's actually out now, so you can order it. Uh, you can because we wasn't sure on the shipping date, and it's actually came in a bit earlier. So now they're being shipped out this weekend, and you can go on there and buy it. We're going to take it to a few local stores in LA, but other than that, I think the only place you could be able to get it is online. There will be 300 copies of the album in September before the only 300 of that right so they're, wow they're all going to be very limited runs they're not doing massive runs yeah and do you take this work on the road at all or, or what's your plan do you plan to tour well i am talking to i'm talking about that right now because i'm going down to tijuana next weekend uh to dj you have my attention <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna dj and tj nice yes. So if you're around, come on down. I'm going down there, and there's a band who are going to be playing at the same time. With There is a girl singer who, by trade, is an opera singer. Oh. But we're going to talk about maybe... Because it's, because with Black Needle Noise, you're talking around 20 singers at the moment. I think maybe more. Wow. So it's, it's difficult to... You can't take everyone on the road. It's just impossible. So I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to talk to the singer and because she will have a, a much broader range. So she hopefully can cover a lot of bases. So then we'll just do it with one singer. Unless we go to a town where there's another singer in town and then they can come up and perform. Yeah, but interesting. Do you, you know, it's, it's just too big a project to take 20 singers to do. <laughs> right. And then do you look at your singers like, like clubs in a golf bag where – I need this one because her voice is very fragile and vulnerable or why 20 singers, I guess is my question. Well, I'm not going to stop there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not stopping there. There's going to be more. There's more on the horizon already. Right. It's, it's okay. With the project with black needle noise, I only want a singer to do two. That's my only rule to the whole project is not to do any more than two songs. So it doesn't become a burden for them so they can enjoy it. They can have fun with it and hopefully be proud of it. And, but then the two songs and then, unless I'm going to change this somewhere down the road, that's all I want. We are back. There's John. Cool. I can't afford any more tickets. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Are you in London? No, I'm in California. Oh, you're in California. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, I was going to say, because, man, the tickets in L.A., the parking in L.A. is ridiculous. I know. Yeah, I've had a few around here, but a couple of weeks ago I was in Hollywood, and for no reason we got to fight it next week. They towed the car. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And then, actually, the day after, someone smashed the back screen of the car, too, for no apparent reason. Didn't steal anything, they just smashed the window. What does it cost to get your car out of the tow yard in Hollywood? Well, it's around three hundred dollars plus the yeah. ticket on top. Plus so, the ticket, so five hundred. You got to pay the storage fee. Yeah, you're. Yeah. Yeah. That's ridiculous. So I have to go. Uh, lucky enough, it's just down the road, but I got to go there and fight it. I had pictures of everything to say there's nothing. I did that one time in Chicago. Uh, I live right by Wrigley Field, and the tow truck drivers are coming tow cars, and we had stickers and everything. And you'd go to this tow yard, and you're like, I have a legal permit to park here. Like, it's $200 to get your car out. You're like, yeah, but I was parked legally. You're like, it's $200 to get your car out. And they'll just keep saying those words to you. You go, oh, I get it. It's $200 no matter what I say or do. You know, it's. I don't think Hollywood's as bad as Chicago with that stuff, but you're right. It's, well, uh, it's crazy. No, because you have to pay – you have to pay the fine to get your car back, and then you have to fight the city to get your money back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which quickly becomes not worth your time because I'm positive that you bill out at more than $10 an hour, you know? <laughs> and that's a 20 hour proposition. No, I'm going to, I'm fighting it because why should they just get away with it? You know, they, they just cleared the street. I even because we wasn't sure if the car had been stolen or, or been towed. So right. we stopped. We stopped, but they were lucky enough a police car was passing. So we stopped them and said, and there were some other people there looking for their car as well. So they called around, they found the place where it had been towed to. And so and we're saying, why the fuck's it been towed away? And they even they stood there and looked and went, 
we have no idea. No idea. So this is Hollywood. We have no idea why they do these things. So. Yeah. Is most of your work here in the uh, Southern California area, or do you go out and do things at other – like we have um, – I don't know. Do you know uh, Wes maybe, the Wesonator at all? He's an engineer. He moves all over the place to work. I used to. Um, now I'm based here, but I used to do that, yeah. From the, the 90s and – up to 2012 or something, yeah. So did you make the conscious decision to slow down and stop moving so much? Because, I mean, yeah, you look at your work. You were the 90s. I mean, all of the big projects, you were in them. And did you just say, enough's enough? I'm just going to stay here in sunny California and slow down? Well, it is nicer doing that. But the thing is, the budgets just aren't there anymore, you know, for bands to do that. A lot of them now, it's... They record themselves and say, and it's just like, hey, can you mix this for us? Right. Boy, we hear that over and over so much nowadays. I mean, you were in the recording industry when there were budgets, when record labels had to invest in artists and develop acts and bring in producers and really capture a process that was magical. And I think one of the things that I keep going back to with guys who have been around for the whole thing is... Are we erasing some of the magic that came from that process that had to be invested in? Yeah. Have we cheapened it? This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole, well, there aren't really any record labels anymore. Yeah, I mean, and let's face it, we're never going to see another Steely Dan album. No, I mean, there's a lot of it. You're not, you know, it's going to be very hard for people to become like, you know, the megastars that they used to be before. Yeah. Because it's so hard starting off for yourself. You know, all these young bands, it's like, okay, they might have media profiles. But to get people out to the shows is a whole other thing. And then, you you know, to keep touring, because they used to be tour support. Now there's no tour support. You know, you're starting off, you haven't really got people paying to come and see you. Plus, you've got to pay everything out of your own pocket to tour. It, makes it is a little ridiculous now that you put it that way. <laughs> and then you have 20 singers on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, for me to, to take Black Needle noise out on the road is I have to... Let's just say I'm going to look at one singer to start with and then, you know, just keep it very minimal, you know, maybe four of us, and then uh, do some shows like that. Does this take that magic that you guys are talking about and force you to invent it in another spot? You can't sit in a uh, studio for three months just jamming out and figuring where the grooves are. Is it stuff like this where you're like, let's take the old rules and throw them away and let's have 20 singers and let's grab all these different things and see what else we can find. Yeah, but, you know, I'm not the first person in the world to do, to work with a lot of singers, you know, was it the Alan Parsons project or whatever it was back in the day? Yeah. Um, you know, Massive Attack have done it. Um, there's lots of bands out there that have done it. It's just that I happened to have worked with this Mortal Coil, which, you know, we did it there too. True. What do you think about the emergence of AI in writing a lot of song material? Because we had, a, I don't know if you know Doug DeAngelis, but he's written a lot of scores and underscores for movies. And he's been talking about the AI space and, you know, the ability for computers to predict and, and create music that we love. If it's not quite here, it's fast approaching. Well, I just saw the other day there was a plug in there which gives you a call program. No, it, hmm. you can put in one note and then it will give you a call projection for right. a song. Yeah. Here. Yeah, it absolutely is here. It's just like the thought we had. So we were at the NAM show. Thank you to NAM as always. We were at the NAM show and I was in the AI panel and they were talking about being able to take music that fits a certain scene, like a couple walking along the beach. And that music's sure. been written 500 times already. And so you can then kind of just twist some dials on the computer. Like I want it to be brighter. I want it to be summertime. I want it to be winter, you know, whatever, and give the computer feels 
And the yeah. thought is, is it'll give you 50 options within that range and you can pick what you want and it'll be exactly what you need. Yeah. To me, they don't really know what they need. Yeah. Because I've done a few things, you know, it's like, oh, we want it to be like this. So you give them something like that. And then it's like, well, that's not really what we meant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then it's like, can you do something else? Then you give them something else. It's like, well, that's not right either. And then they just keep changing their minds or what they're... You know, I've been on the cusp of having some trailer music place. Okay. And five minutes before they sign off on the project, it's like, no, today we think we're going to take it in a whole different direction. So, ah. and then it doesn't happen. For crying out loud. There's a great scene in the movie The Wrecking Crew. Tommy Tedesco is uh, playing a lick. It's, you know, like a flamenco lick. And he plays the lick and they go, no, no, no we're going to do something else. And he goes to a different gig and they go, well, in this situation, we have Starsky and Hutch and they've gone to Ecuador. And he goes, Oh, I got something that's perfect for that. And he plays the same lick. And then he says, now in this situation, this is a feature film and we've got John Wayne. He's going to ride off into the sunset in Mexico. And he plays the same lick. And he, <laughs> he just gives like five situations one after the other, where he plays the exact same link. And they go, yeah, that's brilliant. That's perfect for that. You know, and it's him playing the same lick. I think what you're talking about is kind of the flip side of that, where no matter what you do, it's like, well, that's almost it, but it's not it. And people can't make their mind up. Yeah, you know, or you get the other situation where they do their rough edits or whatever they do, you know, and then they have demo music put in there. Mm -hmm. You know, music is like, okay, you know, we'll change this later. And they get so used to that music that they've already been listening to for six months while they're editing. When they try to replace it with something else, it's like, no, it doesn't sound like the other thing we had, you know? So then they go back to what they had originally. Right, which was the demo music. So here is the magic. I think if we can sum it up, it's the fact that as much as the technology makes us capable of putting something somewhere, there is still the human element where genius still lives and somebody's artistry and individuality comes through and really speaks to us in a unique way. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I will say this. We appreciate you spending some time with us. We uh, are looking forward to Black Needle Noise and all of the releases you have coming up. Our listeners can look on our website. We're going to put links to the Bandcamp pages so you can buy the short runs of audio that are sure to be collector's items. And they're all numbered and they're all signed and John, I'm really appreciative that you'd come on the show. I hope we'll see you again. And now that we know that you're in Los Angeles, because I thought you lived in London, but I'm in Los Angeles all the time, and Pete lives in Orange County. So I'll be in L.A. in about an hour. Or yeah, I hope we can minutes. get you live and not on a Zoom connection. Where are you going in an hour, Pete? I'm going to go to Studio City. So I'll be smack up right all the way through it. So going to go interview Nate Boyer. About Studio City shoot i'd have to look at his address and figure that out i don't know you're headed out at four o'clock in the afternoon yeah. huh? on a holiday weekend <laughs> yeah yeah wow yeah. it wasn't the well, best I'm, far, I'm not far from there anyway i'm over in ben Eyes. so one of okay. the things we do is a thing we call an album fight and it's just this goofy idea we came up with i'm looking at putting two albums together right so track one versus track one is round one like in a boxing match and then you progress through the album, and ideally the albums line up with tracks. But it's we found it to be a really interesting, and it's not about being negative, it's about celebrating great albums. So like we recently did Pink Floyd, The Dark Side of the Moon versus Led Zeppelin 3, and they line up with the same number of tracks. Like if you've got 10 to 12 tracks, most albums kind of line up. Are you have any interest at all in uh, sitting down and doing one of those with us? And what would I do? You just talk about, like, when you hear the two songs played, you would just say, it's like an score like a boxing match. So you would say, in this case, it's Immigrant Song versus Song 1 from Pink Floyd. Song 1 from Pink Floyd is an instrumental piece. And Immigrant Song is one of the best songs on this album. So for me, in this, this you know, you just kind of talk about what happens, what stands out between the two songs in terms of maybe songwriting or the lyric or whatever it is. When would we do this? You know, we just pick a weekend and we just do it like on a Saturday. Yeah, whenever you're free for a yeah. beer. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not that complicated. Okay, we could try. Yeah, see how it goes. I'll shoot you a link to one of the episodes. You can kind of get a feel for it and go. Oh, okay, I get what they're doing. Like we had Wes on, and and he loves the um, Dark Side of the Moon. So he was able to talk 
passionately about certain aspects that we would never think of, especially with him being a sound engineer, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I grew up to lis- listening to that record, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Didn't we all? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hey, thanks, man. We appreciate you coming on. So you're not going to Fever Ray tonight, then, either of you? No. Huh? I'm in San Francisco. You're up in San Francisco? Yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a drive, yeah. You'll be late. A little, little bit. I'll be late, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I am coming down, uh, shucks, at least twice within the next few weeks. And so I go down there all the time. Yeah, we're going to interview J.R. Robinson here pretty quick. You know, the drummer. Right. We're going to grab him and a couple other people. You know, we're always grabbing people. Yeah, so anytime you want to chat, even if it's just a catch up or whatever, we're, uh, we're glad to have you on. Well, I'm around most of the time, say on the 1st July, no, 1st June, I'll be going away to, to Tijuana. Yeah. yeah. Then I'll be back. I like and, um, Tijuana. Hopefully in July we're going back out to Africa to see you all. Whoa. Wow. That'll be fun. Yeah. But other than that, it should be around most of the time. So you just have to hit me up when you're in chat. Terrific. Okay. We will do that. And this will probably go up in the middle of June or so. So I'll put all the links all the links into the show and it'll all be in there and, and uh you promote it however you want and it'll help out. Okay, good. Yeah. So the seven inch I am you is out. Before the Tears Came is the full-length vinyl album, which will be out in should be out in September. But all the other songs you can go to Bandcamp, uh, Black Needle Noise Bandcamp, and you can download everything from there. And you pay as much as you want, and hopefully someone will pay eventually. Yes, support great art, everybody. To our listeners, you know, as always, support great art, support the artists you love, support the work that they're doing. That's how they get to keep doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, John Fryer. Thank you very much, John. Well, thank you. 